Make this the best year ever with Read and Write. Getting a confident start to the new school year is important for every student, especially those with reading and writing difficulties, learning disabilities, or English as a second language. Whether on a PC, Mac, iPad, or mobile device, there's a Read and Write product to suit your needs. The Read and Write family of products can help your struggling reader or writer be more confident and more successful than ever. Read and Write Gold is text-to-speech software that provides tools for reading, writing, studying, and research, while students work within the common applications they use every day. Read and Write for Google provides support tools for Google Docs, PDFs and EPUBs in Chrome on PCs, Macs, and Chromebooks to make Google Apps for Education accessible. And iReadWrite makes reading easier and ensures accurate writing as students use their iPad for school, work, or leisure. Give students the support they need wherever and whenever with Read and Write. Try it today! To learn more about how Read and Write can help your struggling students, visit texthelp.com or call 1 888 248-0652. Again, that number is 1-888-248-0652. If you have students with IEPs, be sure to take advantage of the Read and Write Gold IEP Special. Welcome to the AT Tips Cast, where we explore free or nearly free tools and strategies that can be used to provide more options to all learners. I'm your host, Chris Bouguet. This is episode 138, recorded on December 14th, 2014. A few months ago, one of my colleagues in Northern Virginia invited me to participate in a Google Hangout to present the concept of universal design for learning. He was organizing a monthly event for the Google Educator Group he was facilitating and wanted to launch the initiative with an underpinning and understanding of UDL. We got together, scheduled the Google Hangout, and recorded it. To our surprise, two leaders in the field of assistive technology and universal design for learning also showed up to participate in the discussion. Louis Perez and Marvin Williams added their own insights and experiences to help explain why developing curriculum and lesson plans using a universal design for learning approach is necessary in contemporary education. You can watch the whole thing on YouTube, which I've got linked over at attipscast.com. I hope you enjoy the discussion as we explore a few AT tips along the way. So the whole idea here was that we do like a little half hour introduction to universal design for learning for those that maybe don't know about it. Um, it plus, since we have um, Luis and Marvin on the, on air, you know, guys, feel free to jump in at any time and give your spin on things because I know you have, um, these are guys that I follow on Twitter and that, uh, you know, you're highly respected in the field. And so they would have valuable input on how things work in their neck of the woods. And, and if what I'm saying, uh, if they can corroborate what I'm saying or say, oh, no, Chris, you've totally got it wrong. There's a whole different spin now we put it here. So uh, totally open to that, guys. So feel free to, to jump in. Um, so I'm going to screen share right now just to jump over to kind of the slide deck that uh, I had prepared. You know, everyone has their little spiel on how they do, how they present universal design for learning. And this is kind of how I've put it together. We also thought it would be fun to do a little uh, Padlet. And so the, what this is, is uh, if you were to go to this link, bit.ly slash UDL Padlet, it opens up a Padlet page, which is like an online corkboard, right? So a post-it notes on the wall sort of thing, where you can put your questions, put ideas, um, or at the end, if we talk about tools that we use that um, either Google tools or beyond, any tools, um, you can put those ideas right here on this, on this page feel free to go there. Like, so it's bit.ly slash UDL Padlet. So everyone have that? And this mm -hmm. gets you to the entire presentation right here, bit.ly slash GEG Northern VA UDL. Quick, take a snapshot. Bring out your phone. Take a picture of this if you have to. Whatever it takes to get this in. Also, I like this little visual here of BART. Um, it says bit.ly BART Blackboard. It's a way to make this little image of uh, BART Simpson chalkboard openings. Uh, I think it's a cool tool for students to use. Like this one is the one I made that you'll participate in the best way that works for me. So if you're like, Chris, what are you talking about, Padlet? I don't know what that is. That's fine. I'm sure you know how to use email. You can e email me or Derek afterwards, and we'll get back with you with questions. Okay. By the end of this 
time together, whatever it is, how much time we spend here. Um, this is what we hope you know, that the three pillars of UDL, my wife is a teacher, she always says you have to frame your lesson with the objectives at the beginning. Um, and so these are the objectives. We're going to learn the three pillars of UDL, come up with a slogan to make UDL a little bit easier for teachers to understand than just those three pillars, and then maybe talk about some cool tools that we can use afterwards. Here in Loudoun, we were, one of my colleagues, Mark Nichols, and I were doing a presentation for on UDL for our technology resource teachers, and we were thinking, what are we going to call it? What are we going to call it? We came up with all these different names, and one of them that I thought would be fun was, uh, let's call it more than one way to skin a cat, peeling back the layers of UDL. And uh, the person that was uh, helping us set up the, 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 the session at the time, she was like, are you kidding me? That's disgusting. We're not putting that out as the title. And so we didn't. We just called it back, peeling back the layers of UDL. And then actually when we have everyone in the room, that's when we changed the name. The idea is we're hoping that it sticks with you, right? That, that that will actually have some sort of meaning to you that, oh, Universal Design for Learning really uh, has to do with more than one way to skin a cat, more than one way to do things. Um, and so there's a little meme generator. I'm sure you've seen those pop up on Facebook. That's how you make them. You go to memegenerator.net and you can make your own, like I made that one of the grumpy cat. The best uh, TED video, TEDx video that you'll see is this one linked right here. It's called The Myth of Average. And it's a, by a guy named uh, Todd Rose, who is a Harvard dropout that turned to a, I'm sorry, he's a high school dropout turned Harvard professor. And in that 18 minute video, I highly recommend you watch it. He tells the story of the uh, 1950s, the uh, United States Air Force was were having problems with all the different pilots being able to reach all the controls in all the different planes. And so they went to the manufacturers of the planes and they said, hey, listen, our pilots, they, 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 some pilots are having trouble in the cockpits, um, reaching all the controls. Can you do something about that? And the it, the the people who made the plane said, no, these are our cockpits. It's, it's, you just, just make it work. And the Air Force said, listen, um, we're gonna do, we did, did some research and found out that there is no average pilot, that um, some pilots are taller and some pilots are shorter and some pilots are wider and they all have different needs when they're flying the plane. And so uh, we can't have one cockpit that fits everybody. We need you to design the plane in such a way that anyone can access it. And again, they, the uh, airline companies, that the, the companies that manufacture the airplane said, no, we can't do it. And the United States Air Force said, basically, if you don't do it, we're not buying your planes anymore. And so guess what they did? They changed it so that they made the pilot, they made the cockpits uh, with adjustable seats and they made the controls adjustable so that people of all different heights and sizes and body, body frames could access the controls and fly the plane safely. And so that is a really powerful message. Uh, he goes on to, to draw more parallels to education. That's a really powerful message for us in education is that we should design things in a way uh, that meet the needs of, of as many people as possible as opposed to designing it for, I don't know, some kind of sort of average kid that you think and then and then do uh, all sorts of adaptations afterwards uh, to fit the kids that don't fit that norm. So uh, it's a very powerful video. Uh, I was recently presenting in Arizona and I asked a group of people, I uh, just said, hey, has anyone seen this video? And one person said, yeah, I saw the video. And I said, what'd you think? And her, her term, she was a general educator, said her phrase was, life-changing. I watched that video and it changed my life about how I perceive education. And it was like, yeah, exactly, me too. <laughs> uh, so I hope you watch it. The term universal design for learning is really born out of this architectural term. So stuff that architects use called universal design. This the Center for Universal Design at North Carolina State, sorry, North Carolina State University. They said, these are kind of the principles with universal design. And I'm not going to read the slide to you, but just so you can See, like when you're designing something for as many users as possible, here's what you're looking for. You want to, people to be able to mis make mistakes and that be okay. You want to make it be simple and intuitive. If it's too complex or, uh, or cumbersome, people won't use it. You know, is it flexible so that many people can use it as possible? These are just some of the design elements you'd think of when you're designing a space, like a, a building or um, anything that you're, you're creating. And hopefully those who left are going to watch this video when it's exactly. on YouTube. <laughs> exactly. Anyone can watch a YouTube video. Um, 
here's one of the classic cartoons that that illustrates universal design for learning. This one I am going to read to you. Here you have the, the kid in the wheelchair saying, could you please shovel the ramp? And then the janitor over here saying, well, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. I'll get to the ramp uh, after I do the stairs. And of course, the kid in the wheelchair says, yeah, but if you shovel the ramp, everybody could get in, which of course begs the question, why have the stairs at all? Why don't we just have a ramp? Here are two classic examples of universal design. Uh, not learning, just universal design out in the wild. Uh, here are a picture of these two adorable children standing in front of Walmart, and you see that there are these sliding glass doors, right? Um, they're automatic doors. You walk up, and they automatically open. And how is that universally designed? Well, anybody can get in, right? If you're uh, pushing a stroller, you can get in. If you're in a wheelchair, you can get in. If you're walking, uh, get in. It, it, it basically, you can, anyone can go through those doors, and you don't have to grab a handle. You'll see over on the left-hand side the handle of the door. Um, anyone who's a parent that has had a two-year-old that's ambulatory can walk, goes over, and uh, can grab those handles and push the door and move move through. I don't need to have hands to grab onto that door handle. I can do it with my elbow. I could even do it with my butt if I had to. I could get up there and hit the door and move through if I was carrying something heavy. So the idea is, is that I don't need to be able to grab it. You could probably think of tons of other things that are designed universally. Uh, since we had a little delay, we won't actually do this activity, but I thought if you were to click on this link, it's UDL, UD survey. I would see who in the audience could come up with other ideas. Instead, I'm just going to throw some out to you. When you go to the bathroom and you wash your hands, uh, many places have automatic water dispensers, and so you put your hands underneath, and anybody who can can put their hands underneath, you don't have to you don't have to be able to grab the handles and turn them on. Same thing with the paper towels afterwards. You wave your wave your body part in front of the uh, the little light sensor and the paper towel comes out and now you can be able to wash your hands or dry your hands. Those are some examples. Um, and there's more, tons, tons more. Curb cuts is the other one, right? When you're going into, uh, you're going across the street, how do people who ride bus they, or pushing strollers or in wheelchairs, they usually go to the part of the, the curb. Now here's the crazy thing about how all of those things are designed, like the curb cuts. When the construction workers are making a curb cut. Here's what they do. First, they make a complete curb. Right? They fill it in with concrete. And then a whole separate team, uh, you know, that team goes home for the night, and a whole separate team comes in the next day, and they take jackhammers, and they cut out just the part that they want to make the curb cut. And then they use, like, you know, they make the curb cut. Same thing with those doors in um, in grocery stores, you know, when Walmart's being built, they actually put in doors with with handles, and then a whole separate team comes in, and they actually take sledgehammers and smash those doors down and put in sliding glass doors. And it's kind of amazing that that's how it's done. But Derek, isn't that kind of a waste of time to be able to do it that way? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, it's kind of a waste, right? I mean, Absolutely. Why would they have a whole separate team come in and do that, rip it down, and then put in those sliding glass doors, right? Why would they have a whole separate team come in and put the curb cuts in? I'm joking there a little bit, right? <laughs> um, I mean, they don't have a whole separate team. Too, yeah. Wouldn't it be insane if they did that? And that really is the analogy to how we do it in the classroom. Then he just plan a lesson, and then after that, after they have that lesson planned, they think, well, I'll give, I know there's a couple kids here who aren't going to be able to access this lesson, so I'm going to give it to the special ed teacher, and that person will modify my lesson for those handful of kids uh, for them to access it. And if you draw that analogy to the construction workers and what a waste of time that is, wouldn't it be better if you just designed it that the automatic doors just went in so that the curb cuts were just designed from the beginning so that a whole separate team didn't have to come and cut those out or that you're planning together. The general education teacher and the special education teacher are actually planning at the onset of the lesson saying, hey, what if um, you didn't have to modify this afterwards, we just planned it for everybody. So here you know we must educate students uh, for all of them. And uh, traditionally we've done this by, you know, you, you got the person lecturing in the front of the room or reading a book or um, the dreaded worksheet, you know, that my 
son comes home with every day, you know, some worksheets that he's done at school. He's in fourth grade, and I'm sure you know, right? The worksheets, you remember them from when you were in school. We did worksheets. Some of these uh, same procedures, now we've taken technology, we just kind of plop the technology on, on that same thing. So um, you saw the teacher presenting in front of the map. Well, now they're presenting with a map that's on the interactive whiteboard. Uh, in, instead of reading the paper-based book, now you're reading it maybe on a piece of technology. And uh, that's all cool, right? We like the idea that uh, students are using technology. It's um, has the design of the lessons changed in such a way that they're taking advantage of the technology in the most uh, optimal way possible. Take a look at this kid here, right? This, this cute little blonde kid, the short haircut in front of the smart board. This is a second grade student showing his dad on back to school night uh, how proud he was and that he had access to his class. Look, dad, there's a smart board here in the class. But if you look closely at that picture, Derek, what do you see? Is that kid going to use that smart board? No, it kind of looks confused. I don't see a pen or anything. That's right. Luis is saying, so the, the, well, yeah, there's no, there's no pen, but what was that, Luis? He can't get to the whiteboard. He can't get to it. There's a <laughs> chair in front of it, and there's all this stuff in there. Obviously, this teacher does not understand that the students are supposed to access the whiteboard. It's not just something for her to access. No, brand new to the school. Everyone had those growing pains when they were first getting uh, smart boards where they thought, oh, this is where I put my projector. This is where I project movies to, you know? Um, and then people learn, oh, wait, what if I had the student go up there and do that? Plus, notice the other thing, it is way too high for that student, right? Or for a short teacher. It's I've mountain. seen that quite a bit, actually, where the smart board is put up high because the students will be able to see it better. Yes, exactly. Uh, but this is the point that the whole point of the interactive whiteboard is for it to be interactive. Well, or that it should be. That's that's an excellent point, right? Have it. Those whoever's making that point, have it up high, but have it on adjustable thing, on adjustable tracks, so you can bring it back down low when students need to access it, and then bring it back up high when they're. You know what I mean? So that you can. It's adjustable, like the seats in the airplanes or the seats in our cars. You know, you you wouldn't buy a car that has the seat couldn't move, right? You'd have to have, it has to have adjustable seats so multiple people can buy the car. Same thing with the smart board. That's what I like to see when we go out to the elementary schools in particular. They have the, the Promethean boards able to be adjusted up and down electronically, which teaching high school, I never had thought of that because I'm, I'm like the small person on, in the high schools, but at the younger kid grade levels there, it's good to have that option. Absolutely. You can have, like sorry that. to jump in here, but another thing you can do is uh, you can have the, uh, you can project onto the board, but what I've done is I've used like a 22 and a half inch touchscreen monitor. Uh -huh. uh, you can get them for like around 800 bucks, connect that to your computer, you can project onto the board, you can do everything you want to on that touchscreen monitor, uh, and you can have it down table height so the student can access absolutely every single corner of it, yet you can still have the original board mounted up high enough uh, to best be in both worlds. To, uh, yeah, so it, but, but again, it's just a matter of digging in to find that. Yeah, and so, so the idea, right, the, the whole idea is that all of those things you want to do at the onset. You don't have to retrofit afterwards, right? So how do we reach everybody that way? How do we design it, right? We, we first, we've got to break through the mold that um, we don't want everyone to be the same, right? That everyone is different, because if everyone was the same, we'd be miserable. We'd be like clones, right? So you don't want that. You definitely want different. You, you want to have people be different. And so the way you attack, well, the, really the, the, the definition of universal design for learning is looking at the, how do you, during the planning process, how do I design my lessons in a way that everybody can access them? It really happens during the planning process. Um, and so here's another great example, right? On the left-hand side, you have the Guggenheim. The Guggenheim is designed for all. In fact, um, I don't know if you've seen the movie Mr. Popper's Penguins, Luis. No, no, Martin, guess, you haven't yeah. seen it. You guys got to watch Mr. Popper's Penguins, okay? Because there's um, uh, the scene where Jim Carrey takes, you know, he's, you know the premise of the movie, right? He adopts all these penguins. Well, he, he goes to the Guggenheim and he takes this bucket of water and he throws the bucket of water down the Guggenheim, which is this, you know, spiral-shaped building. And the water goes all the way down the building, and the penguins then can slide all the way down the building, meaning that the Guggenheim is designed in such a way that it's accessible to people, people who can walk, people in wheelchairs, and penguins, you know, everybody, right? as opposed to this 
uh, ramp that is slapped on afterwards as an afterthought, where if someone were trying to get on there, um, they, you know, getting up there and trying to open that door. And basically, just the, if you look at both of those, one of those is really beautiful, and the other one is but ugly. Right? So which would you rather be involved with? Would you rather something that's ugly or something that really is designed well and that people think is awesome? Here's another classic example to help us describe universal design for learning. Uh, for fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. And so here you have all these different students that have to do the exact same activity. So here's the question, because a lot of people have seen this, this cartoon before. Here's the question that I ask everybody who's watching now and in the future. Look at this picture. Which animal are you? Are you the monkey who was able to climb the tree? Are you the bird that was able to get to the top of the tree a different way? I am going to make the case that most of us were either the monkey, you know, we succeeded in school. Those of you that are, that, that, um, are professionals in the educational world, like we, we, we did school, you know, we went to school, we did it, we succeeded, we have good jobs where that are that get pay us well you know um, so we did it we win but what about the other people and the one that I really want you to take a look at the one that I think some of us are don't know it is the fish because here's an example of a fish that actually learned how to climb the tree and sometimes students fool us we think we're doing a good job with the students when really um, they have no other choice, right? I have no choice. If I want to survive in this classroom, I have to try and do this paper-based thing that you're giving me as best as possible. And um, you're not giving me any other option to do. I have, everyone's doing this, this worksheet. I guess I have to do it too. And I'll struggle through it as best I can. And, and you see some students um, still, despite all those adversities, um, come out and, and, and succeed. And so we think, Hey, great! You know they were able to figure it out. They struggled through it and they did it. And really, they're just they're the fish that climbed the tree. What about all the fish that didn't learn how to climb the tree? Could we design things in a way that we could catch all those other fish? So, if you're a general education teacher, yes, I get it. I'm supposed to uh, plan my lessons with a special education teacher, and I'm supposed to plan them for everybody. Um, so, what does that mean? How do I actually design my lessons? And here they are. There's these are the three pillars, right? How do, how do I engage my students in such a way that they understand that I have to do it multiple ways? There isn't, that's not one way to engage them. I provide multiple ways to engage them. How do I represent the content in such a way that it's not just one way, but I'm representing the content, I'm teaching the content using different modalities. And then how am I taking that content that the students now know and how are they expressing it? Are they, you know, are they speaking it? Are they writing it? Are they doing a video? Are they dancing? I don't know, whatever. There's tons of different ways that they can express what they know. Um, so you allow them to have those opportunities to express it in different ways. These are the three things that you, as a general education teacher, working with your special education teacher, think of as you're, as you're designing the lesson. If I, if I might make a quick comment on that slide. Yeah. Uh, when we think about multiple means of representation or action expression, uh, specifically representation, the fact is that if we provide multiple, that helps other students as well. So oh. There might be a student who requires a special format, but if we provide a variety of format, it helps all the other students, you know, see more connections and see how the information is related. Uh, so it, it, that's the whole idea behind universal design for learning is that uh, what's essential for some, uh, most of the time works well for everybody. That's, so that's exactly the point of the next slide, Luis, is that, um, you know, so how did I hear about this, right? How did the assistive technology team in Loudoun County Public Schools hear about this? Did we watch some YouTube video and say, oh, yeah, this is the answer? No, right? We came to it very organically. In fact, Luis, when I first heard the term universal design for learning, I hated it because I was, like, angry, you know, like, uh, so let me explain that for a second. You're like, what? Um, the assistive technology team would go out and what we do is we meet with teachers when students are struggling. And so the student, let's say it's a writing difficulty. Hey, I'm having trouble, the student's having trouble writing. What can you, what can you, what kind of tools and strategies can you put in place to help us? And so we come up with some tools and strategies. And every time we do that, Luis, every time we do that, they would say, oh, that's not just going to help Scotty, who you put, that's going to help Derek and Sandy and Cindy and everybody else. We'd be like, yeah, right. So if you plan it, 
that way, then in using these tools, uh, if you plan from the start, then you can hit all of the kids in your class. And so then we hear the term universal design for learning and we're like, but this is what we've been preaching for years. Come on, now you're just coining a phrase, universal design for learning. And so at first I was a little bitter, like we've been saying this, but we never called it that. And then I thought, no, Chris, get over yourself. You need to realize that the world needs a way to frame this. And so that's why the, the term universal design for learning, that verbiage is necessary. So get over it. Yes, you've been saying it in your little pocket of, of teachers, but the world needs a, a way to understand it. And so that's why I said, okay, I'm going to get over the fact that, that we've been saying it, that it's going to help all these, all every kid um, and realize that the world needs to hear it. But okay, so here are the here are the slides that let's see what you guys think, Marvin and Luis, and then anyone else who comments afterwards. Um, Universal Design for Learning comes out. We've been talking about it for years. It's not really a new concept. And I think every solution, like Universal Design for Learning, hooray, we have a way to help all kids. It brings about new challenges, like this girl accessing the candy, right? Yay, I figured out how to get to the candy. I put this step stool in there, and I can get to the candy, and then, oh, darn it, now I can't get the top off, right? Uh, we've been preaching Universal Design for Learning for a long time. And, and it doesn't seem to be sticking with a lot of teachers. And so how do we get that to stick? Uh, Common Core, uh, you go to the to Common Core. Uh, now we're here in the, the, the impetus for this, Derek, is the Google Educator Group in Northern Virginia. Virginia is, is, has not adopted the Common Core, but most of the other country is using the Common Core, right? And I know there's lots of controversy surrounding it, not talking about that. I'm just talking about where is Universal Design for Learning located when you go look up what Common Core. And Common Core has it in the wrong spot. They have it in the um, section about students with disabilities. It's not in the students with in general education. And so here you have this sort of guiding document of how we are writing curriculum and looking at curriculum across the country, and we've got universal design for learning in the wrong spot. I think it's a, it's a big problem. Hey, back in 2010, the National EdTech Plan comes out, and it's got UDL embedded all over the place. It's an 87 page PDF uh, that explains Universal Design for Learning embedded all through it. It's awesome when you open up the PDF and do a search for Universal Design for Learning, you find it, got, they've got it right, except for the fact that it's an 87 page document with only text. And so when you think about engagement, when you think about multiple modalities, yes, they're talking about it right, but they're not practicing what they're hopefully preaching, which is that, hey, um, you need some pictures, you need some videos, you need some examples, you need to present multiple modalities. It can't just be some boring, uh, I, well, let me ask, how many general education teachers out there do you think actually opened up that 87 page document and read it? They did not make it accessible to the general, I mean, they did, it's there, people can do it, but it's not in a way that people can, can, can really digest it. Huh. Then I think, well, I'm going to teach people UDL the same way I teach people any other words or con concepts that I want them. I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to search it, right? So you go to Google and you search for UDL. Here's a, an example of, uh, of the word ferret, right? You would, if, if Derek didn't know what a ferret was, I'd say, hey, Derek, come over here. I'm going to do a search, Google search for a ferret and look, boom, this is what a ferret is. Anyone who didn't know what the word ferret is, you, you get what a ferret is now? Pretty clear, right? I mean, Absolutely. That's, that's what a ferret is. I'm going to do... Here, this is the universal design for learning. Do that same thing for, put it into Google image search, universal design for learning in Google image search, and this is what you get. Luis, Marvin, crystal clear? You got what universal design for learning is now? <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that just, that says it all. It totally sums it up, right? So, <laughs> no, of course not, right? So it's not, so how do we sum it up? And my thought here is that you take this concept, even though you think three pillars, that's not too hard to wrap your brain around. It's still, teachers aren't getting it. How do we get the message across to all educators? I think, how do we do it with anything else in the world? If I said, just do it, you would know that means, Derek? Nike. Nike. I'm loving it. Uh, McDonald's. McDonald's. Thank you, Brent. <laughs> 
Apple, I'm familiar with that one very well. <laughs> you just know these, right? Because they're ingrained in our culture. So how do we get universal design for learning engraved in our culture? How do we boil it down into its essential point? And I think it's a slogan. And so um, one of my colleagues, Beth Poss, took the definition of universal design for learning and she popped it into Wordle, uh, wordle.net. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, but anyone who watches this now or is watching it now or watching it afterwards, Wordle is a... Uh, it's a word cloud generator where you take blocks of text and you paste it in to, um, into the word cloud generator and the words that are provided and the words that are used most frequently um, pop up in, in larger text, right? And so you can very clearly see here what our slogan should be. It should be, I hope you're saying Provide it. options. <laughs> Provide options, right? Great little tool, by the way, for students. You take a, you you take big blocks of text. Let's say Dr. Martin Luther King's speech. Pop that into Wordle. See what the big themes of are. Or you take a student that keeps writing the word very. I had a very good summer. It was very fun. I had so much fun. It was very very fun. Very very very, very fun. You take that word that that document po post it into Wordle, and you see the word very is is huge. Anyway, that's a way to use that tool for students. But I don't want to lose the point that if you're doing one activity, if you've planned it one way then you're not providing options. You should provide options, provide multiple ways. So every lesson you plan should say, hmm, how am I going to provide this? How am I going to do this uh, in different ways? And so that's what I think we chant from the loop shops is provide options. That's when you're, when you're first introducing the concept of universal design for learning to a general education teacher, that's what the, the one thing you want them to walk away with is, oh, okay, I need to provide more options to students. I can keep doing, I hand out the worksheet and I get the worksheet and everyone has to do the exact same activity. Or I'm going to have them all do something really cool. Like I'm going to have them all uh, do a comic strip. No, the idea is that some kids could do the comic strip and some kids could do a worksheet and some kids would make a video and some kids might listen to a podcast or some kids would make a podcast or the list goes on and on and on. So that's what I think we change from the roof, rooftops. That's what I think, I hope you take away from this lesson, uh, from this little Google uh, Hangout, is that we should provide options to students. And if we do that at, at every level, so that you, it can happen at the classroom level when the teachers are planning lessons, it can happen at the curricular level when the district is saying, how are we going to, how are we going to provide the curriculum for, what is our curriculum for the entire uh, district? It's, well, let's embed some options in there so teachers don't think they have to do this one activity. And then you can use that same philosophy when you're buying your smart boards, when you're buying your textbooks, when you're buying any instructional materials. You think, hmm, before I buy this, um, how is this going to help me provide more options? That's really the difference. That's really what technology is. It's not just doing the same thing we've always done and slapping technology on top of it. It's planning the same lessons and saying, hmm, how can I add technology here? It's how can I design the lesson and use technology to provide more options? Once you know about UDL, then you start, once you know about the philosophy, then it comes to what tools, well, what, what tools can I start to use to provide more options? Luis, Marvin, what did I miss? What do you think? Um, the only thing I would say is that in terms of the goal of UDL, it's really to develop expert learners. And I think in education, we often think more about expert knowers. <laughs> yeah, that's so a good point. <laughs> those are two different things because, um, you know, if you, if you leave with a set of specific facts or specific skills, uh, that may not serve you well in the future because that becomes obsolete very quickly these days with the advancement of technology. But if you know how to learn, that's something you take with you where you can pick up new skills and new information. And that's really the focus of UDL. It's really creating expert learners who are, you know, know how to learn, basically. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. To uh, chime in. Uh, yeah, Marvin, go ahead. Chime in with that uh, piggyback uh, off of what uh, Luis was saying. Um, I think that, because I'm coming at this from the higher ed perspective, mm -hmm. uh, so I've seen these students after you guys have had them in K-12, and so what ends up happening is I get students who come to me, maybe they've had some accommodations, and they have no idea why they had the accommodations that they did. They have no idea how it's going to help them. They've got no idea of what's really kind of going on, um, if they've had any accommodations at all. Uh, so if if this if you do have students that uh, you know you are 
uh, giving some sort of accommodations for, or you're, you're, uh, you've designed your lesson and you've noticed that you do have students who are making use of these different on-ramps to, uh, 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 to the, the learning highway. Uh, it's good if they understand by the time they leave you why that specific on-ramp works for them. Uh, mm -hmm. And even if they're not coming to me as a student with a disability, but as long as they, not just that they can learn, but that they understand how they're learning, why they're learning, because if they know that, then even after I'm done with them and they go on to the work world, they'll know exactly what they need in order to get uh, the, the supports that they need in order to be able to work. Um, there is systems that will help them with that, but those systems aren't uh, as supportive as they are in K-12. So. Uh, they want, those systems want you to know in advance what tools you need. If you don't know what tools you need, it's going to be tough getting them to help you. So uh, the K-12 environment is the perfect environment to not only provide that uh, framework for uh, UDL and be able to uh, get kids that initial exposure, get educators that exposure, um, but also to help students understand why it is I do better with a podcast than with a worksheet. Why it is I do better with a diorama than an interpretive dance. Mm -hmm. So let me add to that, Marvin, is that one strategy that I found useful, in, uh, and I think the rest of the members of my team would say they found useful for helping students help to help themselves figure that out is that so often the teacher is saying, here, well, you should use this, as opposed to, here's a, a menu of some options you have, and you choose which tool you think might work best for you. Maybe even let them struggle a little bit. Oh, that didn't work so well. You know, we call it a tools checklist, just like a table with here are the options you have. You can you can use uh, this piece of technology or this piece of technology or this piece of technology, and let them say, well, this is what I want to choose for this task. For this particular task, I want to do this. So, but giving them some sort of uh, rubric or framework, we call it like a tools checklist. Well, that that's definitely building their autonomy, which is what we want, right? Uh, for them to be uh, self-reliant and self-aware learners. And so if we are always giving them the tools and telling them use this, then we're not building that autonomy that they'll need uh, in the future to kind of, uh, as Marvin was saying, come up with the strategies that work for them. Absolutely. And, I mean, And know when strategies don't work and abandon those and pick up new ones. <laughs> that, that's important, and that's the thing is uh, it helps them to also become uh, uh, wise consumers of even assistive technology because there's somebody out there, uh, everyone will sell you anything. So uh, right. instead of just feeling like I have to hop on the latest and then this doesn't work, well, uh, you know, now my productivity is, is falling off because, well, I thought this thing would work, but I don't really, I'm not sure what, what pieces of it what pieces of uh, assistive technology that help me be successful, I'm not sure what those pieces are or why they help me be successful. So uh, again, I like the idea of being able to go through and say, well, here's some options, like the checklist like you're talking about, being able to say, here's some options and uh, I want to be able to try this or let's try this. That didn't work. Well, why didn't it work? Well, you know, it just it was just cumbersome to use or it was too heavy or what have you. So, Cool. All right, guys, any other things to sum it up here? If you had like one final thought to think about universal design for learning, hey, general educators here, special educators, any educators, this is what the message you need to have. Like my message is provide options. What do, what do you guys say? Um, personally, I'm thinking back at my own teaching. I taught high school Spanish for several years. I'm just thinking of the different, what a world language kind of lended itself to having multiple ways of learning things. You can do a lot of manipulatives, a lot of listening, speaking. Those are all integral skills necessary to learn the language. So I, looking back at lessons, I felt like I was doing some of that, but there are multiple ways of doing each of those activities for listening. And I can have kids with headphones. Um, I can have them listen to groups. I can have them talk to each other. So there's different ways to vary those activities and skills as well. So it's been very reflective. And for me, I would just say is building in flexibility by design from the start. Yeah, the planning process. Okay. I guess I would say uh, uh, just kind of to, I'm taking what everybody else is saying and just kind of I'd like to amplify it but also uh, put out there uh, um, if you're an educator who's uh, trying to go through and modify a lesson uh, ask for help if you're running into a roadblock if you don't quite understand uh, if you don't understand UDL or if you don't understand 
or you're not quite sure how you can modify your lesson, get help, get other eyes, other brains in there uh, to help you figure out just what you can do. Because uh, I know for myself, I miss stuff all the time. I might think that it's awesome, and I'll miss just you know one little nugget of awesome, so I can have somebody else come along and help you pick up that extra that extra nugget. So. Uh, it's great if you can have other folks in there. So definitely ask for help. And I guess I'll add to that, Marvin, that you're just asking for help in your neck of the woods, but look at you guys. I mean, like I said, I've, I, I feel like I know you guys because I follow you through Twitter. The world's a lot bigger place, I mean, a lot smaller place right now. We can, uh, I could ask you for help. I could ask Luis for help. I could ask tons of people that we know through our social media networks for help. So uh, you have, and everyone's pretty, pretty, especially in our neck of, in our field, willing to help. We want to give st strategies and suggestions. All right, guys, Derek, anything else to say to wrap this up? Um, I was just looking at the Padlet. A um, few comments, no, really, no questions, really. Um, okay. I posted, I just thought the history of UDL is interesting, just how we take things for granted, like the sliding doors and the sidewalks and stuff, how it all, UDL kind of came from that. I was just sort of threw out the question of where else can education pull these type of ideas outside of the education world? Where can we look in the business world and elsewhere to find these kind of ideas? Yeah, um, so Mark Nichols, the supervisor for assistive technology here, he and I, when we were presenting the TRTs, we said, once you start to think of it, it's almost like the matrix, right? There's the blue pill or the red pill, whichever one you, once you, now you start to notice it everywhere. He's like, now I notice it when I'm, I'm, uh, my kids are opening their birthday presents and they get, hey dad, here's the, here's the toy, help me get the packaging off. And it's like, God, this is designed so hard to get the packaging off. Why is it designed this way? Or, or uh, you're opening the frozen peas and some bags of frozen peas, you just open right up and it's got a little uh, Ziploc thing. And others are like so hard to pull open. And it's like, why does it have to be so hard? And so, uh, it, it, really, it's a message. If you're if you're a developer at all, uh, software, uh, any sort of product, you should be thinking of how is every going everyone going to access this? Because the wider base that you can make it, it really is benefits everybody. Okay, well, I just, Chris, I'd like to uh, piggyback off of what you just said about and with the uh, the Padlet uh, idea with looking at the history of UDL. Uh, I think it's also important that uh, we support those folks who do create. Um, products, tools that are accessible um, and that we, we, we support people in using them uh, just because uh, there's too many things out there that are not and people are not getting the idea of I need to use this tool and then they end up with a problem. And all you can know is just that there's something else that's available which will meet everybody's needs as opposed to using the thing which might be more popular that won't. That's the lesson from the from the Air Force, right? Yeah, is that absolutely. before you buy it, say, I need you to have, and especially if you're a school district where they want your money, you say, listen, I can't really buy your stuff because yeah, your video your your um your math app is awesome. And I like the little video guy that comes up afterwards where that reinforces the student, but is there captions here? Oh, there's no captions on this? Well, then I can't buy it because I have students with uh, hearing impairments. Oh, you know what I mean? Um, and asking those questions from the developers from the first place so Absolutely. that they, are, they think I need to design it that way because they don't know. You know, they're not thinking in that terms. So or even if, I, even if I don't have students with hearing impairments, know that I will. That's <laughs> right. the thing. I get, I get too many folks who don't, uh, especially in higher ed, uh, we're very reactionary. And that's something which is, you know, the Cal State system, we've gotten a lot better about that. Uh, we've become a lot more proactive, but there's a lot of schools that are very reactionary to where they will only look at making modifications once the Office of Civil Rights is looking at them. Uh, uh, besides, and, besides having students with hearing disabilities, if you have English language learners or foreign students or exactly. all, you know all students who have different vocabulary that they need to learn, <laughs> captions would be good for them too. Absolutely. Exactly. It's good for everybody. Exactly. Exactly. All right, guys. I, this has been awesome. Thank you guys for jumping in here and, uh, and and adding to it. I think it makes it so much better when it's a conversation than just a talking head. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Hope to see you at an upcoming conference at some point. Well, definitely ATIA. I'll be there. So if you're down there, Marvin, can you make yeah, it to ATIA? Thanks again for letting me uh, come in. I won't be at ATIA. I'll be at CSUN. That's my usual haunt. I'll, I'll be at CSUN uh, uh, then. I'll see you there. All right. We'll see you there then. All right. Thanks All right. a lot, guy. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys.
Yeah, I just wanted to take a quick minute here and just thank you guys for joining in and uh, especially thank Chris for doing this. Uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties up front, but uh, you know, the first time you try something, it never goes as planned, even though you test it out several times. So I promise <laughs> right. the next one will be better. <laughs> It'll run more smoothly, but I, I really, again, appreciate all you guys taking the time and contributing to the conversation. I hope those watching will uh, watch the whole thing and participate in some of the questioning and we'll follow up. Totally. Thank you so much, Derek. Really appreciate you yeah, giving us the opportunity. For your, uh, for your tech support, there, man. Not a problem. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed that description and discussion of Universal Design for Learning. Here's a big thank you to Lewis, Marvin, and especially Derek for organizing the Hangout. Thank you! Follow them all on Twitter. Before I go, remember that Beth Poss and I are hosting a pre-conference session at the ATIA conference this year called Technology Driven Data Collection, Using Digital Tools to Document Progress. Using Digital Tools to Document Progress. That full day session is on Wednesday, January 28th, and we'll be talking about how to use technology to streamline and improve data collection strategies. Sign up and bring a friend. It's the perfect present for the holiday season. Register at bit.ly slash data ATIA15. That's bit.ly slash data ATIA and the numeral 15. Until next time, may all your strategies be supportive, may all your interventions be inclusive, and may all your lessons be universally designed. <laughs>